Okay, so the issue was the following, that uh, we have a model of, uh, if we go back a bit here. This was the, the voltage profile in a cer certain situation where we have the feeding voltage in the close to the, where you have the feeding voltage to this distribution system. This is 20 kV. And then uh, the voltage, the further you come out, this is a just a result of one load flow calculation, and then of course, the end here, you get the highest voltage. But then you also have another branch that is going here, and then the, the voltage is going up like this at the end there. So the, because the idea of this is to identify where are the problems, because it's the, the problems are, of course, very ramps here. Because here, you can see that in very few kilometers, you get a very fast voltage increase here. So these are, in reality, the thin lines. Here, you have other smooth change, this means that in reality the, the lines are okay to handle the current, the current current, so to say. And here we have different, okay. Uh, so the challenge is then that this is okay now without any, any bigger problems, but on the other hand, the question is if we are uh, want to derive the hosting capacity, uh, that is how much more solar, power, because that was one, is one of the issues here. Because right now, they have, what have happened in Germany is that they have increased significant amount of solar power because it was so profitable that though it was extremely, you made a huge amount of money in installing solar power. And of course, if you make a huge amount of money, the in investments goes very fast also. Uh, but then uh, it's not as profitable right now. So now the increase is not that fast. But on the other hand, the question is that this will, because the goal in Germany is to, is to really increase this significantly. And then the question is then, of course, the grid companies want to know uh, if they have to invest in the grid. Because one of the issues is very much that, for example, solar power, you can phone someone and then you get a solar power in some months. That's not a problem. But you can never phone someone, I want a new grid. And then you have a new grid in two months. That's not possible. So the, and that is one of the bigger issues because you, you really have to plan the grid long term in advance. And then you know what normally grid owners is that they are the margins, so uh, they can handle uncertainties just because you may hear that to build a new grid is not that easy because you have to allow it to have, a, you have to have a new line somewhere and people have to accept that you have the line there or you have to just say that I don't care that you don't want it. I have the line here anyhow. So, so I mean, this normally a long time, at least in de democracies. It's easier in other countries. Anyhow, so <coughs> the question was see, in this grid, the question was, of course, the hosting capacity, but then an issue was also perhaps the battery could help. <coughs> and here, <coughs> the idea is that you uh, look on the, the battery, and then you also have, of course, if you have a battery, it's DC, so then you have to have a converter. Here, you, in reality, by just looking at this slide, you can directly see the conclusion. The issue is that a converter costs around 200 euro per kVA, while a battery costs 250 euro per kilowatt hour. Okay? Assume you want one kilowatt kVA during one hour, of course, then you need 200. This you can use the whole year without any problem. There are no operation cost, anything like that. You can use it 8,760 hours a year if you install this one. How long time can you use this one? It depends on the battery size. This means that active power is much more expensive and you cannot use it as much as you can use the reactive power. And then you remember the formula I had earlier that you have R times X plus uh, the question was uh, which is the most important issue? Is it the reactive power or is it the... Uh, there was a formula, I don't have it here, but it was something like this. R times uh, X times Q, and then it was R times P. That was the... And then you had this delta, the voltage was equal to that one times divided with the voltage. And then the question is, here you see that the Q is much... The Q and the RP has around the same cost, if you say it per, per hour at least. Uh, 
but the q you can use all the time. And then, of course, the, the Rx quota come in here, because the question is if you want to control the voltage, you can do it with P and you can do it with the Q. And then, of course, if X and R has the same value, then, of course, it's better to do it in Q than to do it in P, because Q is cheaper than P. And that is just a fundamental uh, understanding of, of, of how this works. And, and now I have already, this is called spoiling. I think I spoiled the result already, but I, I will, you will see it later. <coughs> so uh, anyhow, uh, so this is not, uh, this was uh, what we found out. I mean, this was not a thing done before the project, it was done. Uh, the issue on the other hand is that the question is what happens in the future. These are uh, today prices. What may happen, because that is a very big challenge nowadays that with all these electric vehicles and so on, that this may go down in price. And then, of course, if this go down to, let's say, half the price or a quarter of the price, then, of course, this starts to be interesting. But Q is much cheaper than P. And remember, I'm not talking about operation cost here, because the operation cost, I just talk about the investment cost here, because the operation cost is more or less zero for this one, is zero for this one. Yeah, you, you lose some efficiency also in the battery, because you have the cycle that you are, you are charging the batteries and, and, and discharging the batteries. So that is a cost, of course. But I think the economic issues here is rather important when you are starting to think about what, which is the, the best solution here. And it has very much to do with the Rx quota out in the system. And then, uh, if I can go back to here to the grid then. The issue is here then, then that first, here in this point, you keep a fixed voltage. This is 20 kV here, all the way out to some consumers, and then you can have, uh, this is, yes, this is the low voltage grid. This is also the low voltage. So here you have the 20 kV, so here you have a dominating, uh, first you have a transformer here, you have the, keep, keep a fixed voltage here, so here R and X is around the, out here. Then here, you have a transformer, which is a dominating X, nearly only X, and then you come out to the low voltage, and then when you come out to the low voltage, you have dominating R, because there you have lines, at least in, in Germany, you have, I think here you have over, so then perhaps you have a significant X also, but at least you have a significant R. So here, so when you come out also here, then it depends on where you are. If you are here, you have a certain Rx quota. On the other hand, if you come out here, you have another Rx quota. And that, of course, has an impact on is it the Q or the P that has the biggest impact on the voltage drop? So we have this model validation here. So the question is, what major challenge is the sizing of the battery storage system, because that was the idea here, that somewhere we should, the idea is to put out the battery storage somewhere in the system. And then we should remember that a battery bank and a converter unit, this means, of course, that, <coughs> that the converter unit is, uh, and the battery, of course, you need a converter. But in the converter, you can supply reactive power. And, and uh, the battery, you can, so with the battery bank, you can charge the battery. And then the question is the size of the battery, because the question is that if you have, uh, I mean, the question is the peak then. How long is the peak? Because if the peak is four hours, then you have to, if you want to do something with active power, you have to be able to, to uh, use the battery for production during four hours, for example. So the, the question very much, if the peak is very sharp, let's say you have one specific hour, whoop, where you have the problem, then of course you can use the battery only for one hour. Perhaps you need, of course, enough capacity in the battery to use it in one hour. But of course, if it's a long, long peak during four hours, if you want to use it in battery, then you have to have a rather story, big storage capacity. So then the question is, of course, the sizing of the battery and where to put it and so on. And then, of course, you need some kind of control system in order to, to, to handle it. I mean, how should I control it? When should I charge? When should I discharge? And so on. Uh, so the battery system, ESS, it's the BSS, battery storage system. <coughs> 
Okay, so this you can, and that is what this is, uh, everything is from Puria here, so he has formulated and made several papers in this area. So this is, an, of course, as everything else in grids, it becomes an optimization problem where to put it and have some limits. So the battery states of charge, you have the battery here, the state of charge is uh, depending on you have a state of charge at the end of the hour, and then you have the state of charge at the beginning. Yeah, but an issue with the battery charging, you must, of course, remember is that this is the so-called deterministic planning. We know that the loading is like this. Okay, we know that the loading is like this. Oh, sorry, the voltage will become like this. We don't. And then we might identify that. Okay, here we we should try to uh, use the battery during these specific hours. And then, of course, we charge. So here we discharge, use battery, use BSS, and here somewhere charge BSS, charge BSS. But this is a deterministic issue, as you understand. You know, you, we take the graphs from an historical situation. In reality, you don't know this, because you don't know exactly that this will be the peak. It depends on the, on the situation. So this is, let's say, an um, optimistic way of using it when you are, you, then you can have stochastic optimization here, but then it becomes more complicated. But this is the, the basis here. The, so the battery constraints, the question is when you should charge, and then you discharge, and then you, you lose some energy in, in, the, in that one. So we have the state of charge in the next hour, depends on if you have used it. And then the state of charge should be there is a minimum level that you can discharge the batteries to, and then you have the maximum charging, of course. And then the question here, we have assumed that if we simulate a day, we have assumed that you have the same charging in the beginning of the day as in the end of the day. And then you have the converter constraints, and then you have grid, grid constraints to keep the voltage and so on. And then the question is to maximize the hosting capacity. So this is a rather com complicated optimization problem, but he solved it. Uh, so here, <coughs> this is the low voltage grids, number of low voltage bus nodes and the consumer nodes, and, and so that's a rather large system in order to handle this. So it's of course, what is what I think nice here. This is not an IEEE grid or something. This is a real grid where we got real data. So we are, and that is the because, for example, this with RX quota. In the read, the question is, of course, it's different in different grids, but I mean. What is the normal R and X in a grid? And that was one of our first things that we really identified. But, but in a true system, because let's say you have a 20 kV system, it may, normally it is like this, that in the beginning you have rather thick areas because you have, uh, of course, the grid owner is planning for this. So in the, because in the beginning of the grid, close to the trans feeding transformer, you have a big current, so you have thick areas. But then when you come out at the end, you have thinner and thinner areas, but you have the same X which means that in the 20 kV grid you will get different Rx, uh, XR quotas the further out you come. And then the question is, but how is it in reality? And that, of course, what's very nice when you, we get data from a real company. I don't say that this is in any way an optimal grid, but at least it is a, it's a true grid, it's a real grid. So, and I think that this kind of studies, I mean, let's say, I, I think it, I mean, let's say that you did exactly the same study here in India, probably you will get perhaps completely different results because you have another grid, other grid data, other consumer data, and so on. So here was the, here we have instead bus number here. Try to identify where the, where, where the, <coughs> and then you can see that there are uh, low voltage grid bus is the critical day of the maximum hosting capacity. Here we assume that you should manage the absolutely worst situation, which is in the grid, in the low voltage grid, and it's extremely sunny, everything at the same time, and it's a very low demand. And then we which are the critical buses. So then we said that we should never anywhere accept more than 1.1 per unit, 10% so voltage increase. And then we got it in that. So that is, let's say, the dimensioning node. And this means, of course, that you could, and here the interesting issue is that let's say that we do something about that one. We put some kind of battery here close to this one. So then we perhaps we can decrease that one. But then this one becomes the worst thing. And then perhaps if they are close, it's perhaps better to put it somewhere close so you are managing both these at the same time. So the question is where to put the battery. 
So do you have a small one there, a small one there, or a bigger one in, in the central point? That was, let's say, the question here. So this was the uh, result. <coughs> Uh, the hosting capacity improvement is size. So here you have the, uh, this was battery sizes, and these are converter sizes. And then the question was how much you could improve the hosting capacity compared to a base case when you don't have these kind of things. <coughs> and uh, then you can see here that, yes, you started with 10% increase if you have a small converter here, but then if you increase the battery size, you will slightly increase the hosting capacity. But uh, what you also know is that going from here, remember zero here, zero battery means in reality that you only have the converter. So what you see here is that you go from that point to that point, from zero kilowatt hour to 80 kilowatt hour, you could of course increase this one significantly. But on the other hand, if you instead of that buy a bigger converter, you could increase it much more. So the reactive power and is, is around the same cost as, so here you go from 0 to 80, then you increase it with 2%, but if you instead increase the converter from 20 to 40, which is 20, here you increase it with 80, you got 2%, here you increased it with 20, you got 6%. So here you can directly see that the converter is much more important. That is of course with current, but, but here you can identify how much cheaper must the battery be in order to make this interesting. And then of course if the battery is interesting, then of course also the converter, I mean if the battery go down in price, it may happen. I don't know exactly the converter development. I think converter, there is of course a converter development that they can be cheaper in the future. But I must, to be honest, I, I doubt that they can go down to a quarter of the price or something like this. I, not so much. But on the other hand, I think that a battery, they, there is probably a, a more bigger potential of cost decrease. So I think that batteries can be cheaper in the future. While um, converters can be cheaper, I, but I don't think they go down with, let's say, 50 or 70. I'm not sure about that one. It depends. There's a lot of uh, silicon carbide and a huge of discussion of new components and so on. But what you see here is that, that if you just have a big converter, you can do more. The interesting thing with a converter is also that converter you can use all the time and with rather low losses. The batteries you have losses in. And in time, the batteries, they create losses and you can only use them for a limited time. Of course, if you have a very big battery, then of course you can use it for a, very, for a rather long peak, so to say. So then we identified some specific cases, as we see here. One specific case with a very small converter, but a big battery, and then another case here with a, you can call it a medium uh, battery, uh, a medium um, uh, size converter, but uh, two battery sizes, which uh, here you see that there's not so big difference. And then we made, and then it is uh, one size with no, bat no battery at all, but a big uh, converter. And then uh, just to identify the total cost. But then, of course, the, this was a big higher cost. Uh, here, here you have much higher cost than earlier. But then you can, of course, see that if you go back here, this one, here you have rather high battery cost compared to earlier. But I mean, well, you can directly see that this one is providing the highest. But on the other hand, it's 160, which is double as much as this one. But even if you have around the same cost, this is, is better. Here in this comparison here, we have a slightly higher cost, which is the, let's say, the today prices of the batteries. So, even if we at more optimistic prices, it, it, uh, that you, you still have a challenge. Because the question, this is how, how it works. I, I don't take all the details. Because this is how we operate the system with, uh, with the different batteries. There's a lot of output, of course, from this. Here is one of the issues. And that is this cumulat cumulative, cumulative uh, Rx ratio which I have discussed all the time, which is the important issue here, since 
the R, the X is, has, uh, in, because that says something about if R and X are around the same size, then the Q control or the P control have the same impact on the local voltage. So the question is here that here you have a transformer. If you keep a constant voltage here, then you first have the megawatt line here. And then you have the transformer. And very often, this is very significant. If you see the impedance of this one, it depends on how, I how strong this transformer is. But very often, I, I, when I've seen these kind of figures, th the impedance of this one is significant. It's, so here you have a significant x. And then, of course, here you have low voltage lines. And here, of course, you have, in reality, the, the here you very often have dominating R here. But then on the other hand, this dominating R can often be compensated by this one. So in reality, when you come out here, you will have uh, Rx, uh, R and X is around the same. But it's like, because that has an impact on if you should control the P or the control the Q. So here you can see the Rx quota in the different buses. <coughs> so it is slightly different. And it's direct when you come out. So oh, if we go up here again. If you are here, it's normally rather high x, because here you have the dominating x. But on the other hand, if you come out here, you have added so much r that is compensating. So here you get more and more and more r, while here you have more x. So the nodes out here have more r, while the nodes here have more x. So here, the, the X is important, the, the Q is more important than if you are further out here. So the, if you put it out here, then of course the value of the P control is more than here, the, the value of the Q control is higher. But then of course you have the, these different costs also. So here is the, uh, the Rx quota. <coughs> Uh, and then you have the different nodes here. And then you say, with the, mag the media volt, low voltage transformer, uh, uh, without the transformer. OK, so this is here again. If you only look on this grid, that is without this transformer. But if you also include the feeding grid here, then we get another data, just to identify. So it's the Rx quota, and that means that if we, this was a real grid, so what you see here is without the transformer, that is the only the lines, then it's at least 3. So the R is 3 times higher than the X. But if you come on to the real, because when if you include all the grid, the Rx quota is what you see here, that here somewhat in one point, which is very far out in the grid, where you have a long part of, of, the, of the distribution grid, then the R X quota, so the R can become three times more than the, than the X. But in the other points, it's very, very often. Direct here, these points are directly after uh, the transformer. And then you more or less have a dominating X, because the R X quota is here below 1. So here you have, in reality, dominating X. These are the different feeding points here. So in the, the real value is around that R is around equal to X. And then, of course, if it's lower here, say that x is dominating. And then, of course, since the q is cheaper than the p, then, of course, and if the x is also bigger than the r, and then, of course, q is much better to control the q for, for voltage control. Then. then you have another value of the battery, of course. And that means that you can have the price difference. It can happen that if you are, uh, when it's a technique, it could be that in the peak situation, which I, we have not included here. This is only for battery control, because it's the grid owner that is managing this. Battery has another value, of course. It may happen that in the middle of the day, we have a surplus of, of solar power, so the price on the market is zero. So then, of course, it's better to store the power and also use it later, just because of the, the, the trading issue. But here we are only using the battery. So there you have an extra value of the battery. But from grid control, at the way the grid we have looked on is, is uh, it looks like this, and I think if I if I just see the without doing any analysis since you have more overhead lines here in in the distribution and also in, I don't know exactly but it's, I think you will have also more x here than than r I think on the other hand it depends on also on the size of the of the, the, the can anyone say the, the voltage here in the in the wall 
is it is it always 220 is it how how fixed is it because that says something five plus minus okay okay so I mean if it's if it's a good voltage then of course this means that the area cannot be too thin because then it doesn't work so it's okay but I think that I, I have the feeling that since I mean in in, the, in Europe we have more cables and in cables you have dominating R everywhere and it's also in, in Stockholm for example you don't see any overhead lines at all and that means that we have much more dominating R and it, in these worms where I were I didn't see any ca uh, lines nearly anywhere and this means that they have cables and they, that means that they have much more dominating R there compared to you have more dominating X here so and since you have dominating X I think the reactive power is even more extra value because of that. Okay, and then we discussed the uh, energy loss and so on. Yes, that that is of course. Then we maximum current change in the mega. Okay, that's not so important. But this is energy loss in the low voltage grid in regard to total energy losses. And then the question was, what happens with the losses? And the, then you see here that it's not that big difference. It's uh, energy loss in the low voltage grid uh, in percent in regard to the total. So what you see here is that, yes, this was better. On the other hand, it also created a bit more losses. That is also what we saw yesterday in my small calculations of the grid, that reactive power can be very good for the local voltage, but you increase the current significantly, because that is, of course, important that here we have 160 and here we have 80. And this means, of course, that here you create rather much current. And then the current will create losses, which is, of course, a cost in itself also. So th we have not exactly gone down to the cost of losses, but I think that, uh, so, so reactive power is better, but it can create losses also, of course, and that depends then, of course, the size of the R, then it's not the, the Rx quota, then it's also the size of the R, which has an impact on, on let's say, the, uh, the impact from, 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 the, uh, from the reactive power. And then it was a discussion here about if you should have a central battery storage. This was a general issue. And then, of course, the issue was also where to put it. So you could, you could have different locations here. So there were some discussions about if you should have it here or if you should have it out here. Because then, of course, that was yeah, you got different results. I don't go into all the details here. But I, I will, I should... Um, Exactly. This is in a paper that was presented in Torino just this uh, this autumn. So this is rather new things. <coughs> so also the same effect of active and reactive power in voltage regulation, but batteries pack has a higher price. And when I say also the say all almost the same effect of active and reactive power in voltage regulation, then exactly this is this Rx quota. So <laughs> I'm coming back to this all the time. Where where, where the grid, it's the Rx quota that, that uh, is important. And then the question is what kind of, for example, if you have bad transformers, if you have a transformers which is not over dimension, then of course you get a significant X in the, in the transformer, which is of course important. Uh, so battery bank has a higher price and less uh, effect in compared to converter unit, uh, but that is of course has to do with Rx quota, as I said, depending on where you are in the grid, because you have different Rx quotas in different points of the grid. And then you have this larger bat battery bank can reduce the maximum current and, and the loss, so you have an extra benefit of the active power, because the active power reduces losses more than, than the reactive power. So that is, let's say, a benefit. <coughs> Uh, larger power converter increases slightly the maximum current and, and the loss. And, uh, the, and that is, I, I didn't t talk so much about this maximum current, but that is the, I mean, you have the battery out here, and then the question, the current change here. And that means, of course, that if the ch current is changing here because of reactive power in this one, that, that depends, of course, that you have more current here. And if you have more current here, this will also, of course, that is what is creating the losses. This with maximum current, is of course an issue if the current is the problem in the grid. In this grid, I don't think we had any information about the maximum current. 
you have maximum currents, of course, as a problem. It's in the cables, you have maximum, but also in, in overhead lines, you have maximum current. So the problem is what you have to identify is, of course, if maximum current is the problem or if it's the pro voltage that is the problem. It may be the current also. So that's why we also calculated this. Uh, yes, and then react, so reactive power control, as at least what we have seen, because earlier, what I think is a bit new here is that people earlier have said that no reactive power is not so much valuable because since you have dominating resistance in the distribution grid, reactive power, because of this equation here, the reactive power doesn't have so much impact. But in reality, I think it has, because you ha also have to consider the whole, the, the whole voltage in, in the feeding grid. Just one small thing, uh, which was discussed. Ah, I can take the slide here. There was a discussion in this, uh, in this project with the grid company that, uh, and they have, I think they have already purchased this, but you could have voltage control in this one. What you normally have, this is the low voltage. Uh, here, here you normally have voltage control. I think you have it in most places because somewhere you have to, so you keep a nice voltage here. Uh, you could also have voltage control here. And then you keep, of course, a nice voltage there. You could also, in a situation with a huge amount of solar power here, you could decrease the voltage here so you get it lower than one per unit so you can accept more things here. And if you keep a fixed voltage here, then in reality you have dominating resistance here. So then, of course, then, so then because then of this one and these ones and that one will not inc be included if you have a voltage control on this one. On the other hand, Voltage control on this one, this means a transformer from 11 kV down to, to 380 volt or, or to, to low voltage. Then, of course, these transformers with online tap changers are extremely expensive. What they told me is that it costed, I think it was 60,000 euro or something. Uh, so that is, uh, it's very expensive. But that, that is 600,000, it's around 6 million, uh, 6 million, but that's for a specific size, 6 million rupees. So it's, it's rather, or a bit, 5 million rupees or something. And that is for, what they told me is that, that the, the online tab changes on that one is four times more expensive than the uh, than a tra traditional transformer. And that is very much money compared to all these kind of batteries. We, I am not seeing exactly the calculations, but I think that that is much more expensive. But if you have it, but if you find out that that can be cheap, then of course, then the, we will have really dominating R from this point out to this point, because then you only have, if you have cables, of course. Okay, so this was uh, about um, voltage. I have two things more I will bring up here. I have got slides. I will take you uh, very fast. It was I talked about it uh, yesterday, but this is the real, a real case. This is from another real case. It's from a reactive power management for wind farm in sub sub transmission networks. So this is I talked about it a little. That is from a, a new installed wind farm in in Sweden. Uh, no, they are planning for it, and it's from Aeon, which is uh, this grid company. I will make this rather fast, I think, because I already talked about this. It's not so much new, it's just that the, the, the issue is that it's not an Excel program. This is reality. That's the difference. <coughs> so, uh, this is not the issue. This is the issue. This is in a place in Sweden. We have a town called Sundsvall. We have some big metal industry there. And they are discussing a new, this is a connection to the transmission grid, and this is a 130 kV grid that they are going to install just for some wind farms that will be located here. And here is the connection between the local grid and this Aeon, they will own this grid. And they will have a connection here to the, 
to the uh, transmission grid, the 400 kV grid. And this is 60 kilometers, and this is uh, 35 kilometers, so it's a rather large area. And just to compare with India, there is nearly no people living there. Anywhere. So that's not so. Uh, and the idea is wind farm, and it's 1,200 megawatt of installed capacity, which is a rather, rather big. So they build a new 100 transformer here, and it, the idea is that it will look like this, that you have the 400 kV system here, uh, and then we have the two transformers in parallel, and then 130 kV system, and then a grid out to all the wind farms. So it's mainly, a, you can call it a contribution grid from the wind farms. But then, <coughs> oh. <coughs> sorry. Okay, so this was, uh, they have uh, some discussion about uh, what is happening with the voltage far out in the system, depending on what uh, the transformer size and so on. But I will come into this with uh, reactive power. So what they see is that first you have the, the wind farm and then you have the what is happening is that if you have a huge amount of, of uh, wind power out here and then you are, so the wind farm is normally producing they have the internal transformers, and then it goes normally the, the wind farm, uh, as at least in Sweden, the, the normal standard voltage for, for wind farms is 33 kilovolt, which in the internal grid. And then, of course, they will have a transformer up to 130. And then, of course, so the co I mean, step one was that do they need some kind of, that was step one, do they need some kind of internal compensation just to keep a nice voltage there? And they have identified that supply of reactive power is desirable for compensation. So they tried to identify that as a step one. Because the question is, which I will come to, is that uh, that, will, that the system operator on the 400 kV, they have required that in this point need some reactive support. Because these kind of power plants will in reality in some cases replace a big thermal power plant. Because we will get wind power and instead of having a thousand megawatt power plant here that is keeping the voltage in the synchronous machines. We will instead have a big grid with a lot of wind power, and then of course the, the system operator needs to have a reactive support here. That is, let's say, the, the background of, of what I'm talking about here. So first, it was this, the question about what, what do you need for kind of reactive support out there anyhow. Here come the question then. <coughs> uh, Active power production in this grid from the wind power will be zero to 1200 megawatt, depending on the wind situation. Uh, normal operation, and this is what I said earlier, this is the requirement for the system operator nowadays, that they say that, ah, oh, you come with your grid, you want to connect it to our grid, we don't accept normally any kind of reactive support. Uh, so you should keep per hour within zero megavar plus minus five megavar. This is extremely accurate. Remember that we have a big grid here of 60 kilometers. And then of course they have sometimes they are consuming reactive power. They are producing reactive power in the, in the capacitance of the lines and so on. To keep this to exactly zero is of course a big challenge in itself. But these are the requirements that we have in Sweden and it's a discussion that goes more to this. And then this new thing came. When needed, we need plus minus 10% of the recent active power as reactive power. I have not exactly understood if this is per hour or if it is per minute or per second or whatever. Anyhow, there must be some kind of control in order to get this. And then, of course, uh, the total need for reactive power in the new set of cluster, uh, that is just for the internal needs, because when you transmit power, you consume reactive power in the lines. So the question was how to handle this. This was the real case. So one idea was to have shunt capacitors everywhere, a lot of switching, which is don't, uh, the, I mean, you have to switch on and off these capacitors, which is not so nice for the system. You get transients when you switch, and you have ba uh, bad control. And the question is that you need an exact thing here. The e since you need exactly zero here plus minus five, 
you need to have a capacitor of different sizes that you have to switch on and off. You then you need to switch them on in, in steps of five megavar because that is what you need from the system point of view. So that's why they I don't you don't see it here, but you have one capacitor of five megavar, ten megavar, twenty megavar, thirty, forty, hundred, and then you can combine them in different ways depending on how much you need. So this is of course a challenge. An alternative is then of course to have you can uh, have SVC, static war compensation. Oh. Static war compensation, which means that you have switches in, in power electronics for all these power uh, capacitors and so on. This is nice, but expensive. So that is uh, how, how it looks like. You get less switching and, of course, continuous control and this kind of thing. But then they found out that this was the best solution wind turbines and shunt capacitors. So they have the, con the continuous control they have in the wind power stations, and then they have uh, big shunt capacitors here, which they don't have to switch so often. Then. So that was found out to be the cheapest solution. And this is, uh, and the whole idea is what I re talked about earlier several times, that e when you have, when we, I mean, I'm not talking about a little of wind power now. I'm talking about high penetration, I'm talking about situations when the whole country is supplied only with solar wind power. Then, of course, you need the transmission. You need to keep the voltage in the transmission system. And then, of course, one version, one alternative is to do that with the available controllable capacities you have in the, the wind and the solar power. Just about this German grid, we are currently checking in the, in the German grid if the solar power could also control the reactive support to the feeding in the feeding point to the transmission. They have other projects in that. But this, let's say, th the bigger issues that are discussed when we come into this with, uh, uh, these are the issues you c when, when we are discussing high, high penetration of solar and wind power. It's not a question of local control. It's the question on the transmission system, on the countryside, I mean, how to match the whole system. That is the, when I, that's at least when I say high penetration. I don't mean high pe penetration in the local grid. I mean high penetration in the country, and then you get these kind of extra things that you need to do something about. Okay. That was this, and that was about... So then they have a lot of uh, ideas, uh, control the reactive power and uh, how to do it, and they have simulated how to do it, and so on, but I don't simulation results and reactive power supply to the system operate and how it can work because, we, I mean, this is to be built right now and they have simulated a lot of things here. Summary, ah, oh, summary. Ah, oh, I don't take it, take all these things. Okay, I will just make a short, uh, I tried to make a compact version of this one yesterday, but I didn't succeed. This is another, I will just say a little bit, this has to do with distribution system expansion. I will just say a little about, uh, I will only use some of these slides here. Uh, what, what this is, I don't know if this is, did you say that in India is only one grid owner, that they own all the grids in whole India? Is that correct? Yes, but in the distribution grids, for example. I mean, the, if you take the grid from the transmission and out here, for example, this grid here, is it owned all, also, also owned by the state, Indian state? Ah. Ah. So, so this grid you see here, the lines here, that is owned by the, the, the state. Ah, in Sweden we have 200 different grid owners. <laughs> Pardon? Okay. The okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for example, in Sweden, it works like this, that we have 
my house here. And then I have a grid here, which is 400 volts. And then there is a transformer. And then it's, uh, I think, I think it's 20 kV. And then there is a transformer, and then it's up to 400 kV or somewhere. This grid, I don't know exactly the transformer to the grid, somewhere here. I don't know if it's on one of these sides. I don't know who owns this transformer. But this grid is owned by one company called Elevio. And this grid here is owned by a company called uh, Swedish, Swedish Transmission, we can call it. Profit maximizing company. They have money. In, uh, it's uh, owned by Canadian pension funds. And of course, the Canadian pensionists want to have a huge amount of money, so they are maximizing their profit, really try to make as much money as possible. But on the other hand, then, then you have an economic regulation, so you cannot do whatever you want, because then, of course, I have to pay a lot. And of course, if I was a uh, pensionist in, in Can Canada, of course, I want to. My charge is to be high, but now I'm sorry, I'm living here, so I want this to be low. And then there are, of course, the challenge of economic regulation. And that is what we, have, uh, what we are discussing very much today in Sweden and very much in Europe in general, how to control maximizing profit maximizing companies, since they are, of course, want to have as high tariffs as possible, but then you have to keep it. On the other hand, of course, they must earn money, because if they don't earn money, they cannot manage the grid. I mean, if they get bankrupt, then I don't have any grid any longer. Okay, then another company will buy them. So you have to be able to make money in grids, otherwise you will not do it. Or you have to have a state control. On the other hand, if it's state controlled, the question is, are you paying the, the grid with the, with the taxes then? Of course, anyone, it's, finally, the people anyhow would have to pay for the grid. The question is just how you pay for it. Is it in the grid tariff or is it through the tax? Tax is, of course, easier because then you can select who is paying the tax. But they are normally not to pay the tax, the one that could pay the tax, but that's another issue. So this is, um, this is perhaps a bit outside what we are discussing, but that is, let's say, the issue we have. So the big challenge in Sweden concerning a, a grids force the grid companies to do what is smart. Is they are not, because what is smart for them is what they can earn money on. And then, of course, you must have an economic regulation that forces them to do something that is smart. And that has very much been the issue here. How to, if you have a, because let's say you have a grid like this. I can tell you a little about the challenges in Sweden. Let's say we have, we have a grid here, a grid area, and then we have a lot of grid here. And then you come with your wind farm, and you want to connect. Then the grid owner say that, first of all, this grid, this one, you have to pay. You pay. This grid owner, have, uh, this wind power owner, of course, have to pay for this line. But then the grid owner may say that, yeah, but you come with your huge amount of power here, then I have to strengthen this line here also. So then, since you caused this, you have to pay for this one. Because if you don't pay for this, all the other ones in this grid have to pay for this. So be fair in some way. And this is a general problem. It's not a big problem if you have big, as, as in, in India, for example, if you can, of course, tell them that, okay, uh, we have the new grids, everyone has to pay in, in some way, or the state has to pay. But if the state has to pay, then the taxpayers have to pay. So that is not a very good solution either. So, um, of course, you want to have an efficient solution. The problem is, on the other hand, that the grid owner can say that, no, 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 you cannot pay here, you cannot connect here. You have to connect. So you, you have to pay for that line. So there's a lot of discussion how to force the grid owner to act in a rational way. This, you can say, is a consequence of so-called deregulation, profit maximizing. And it seems like you don't have this problem, on the other hand, in, in, in India. On the other hand, the challenge is still how to... And because the challenge in Sweden is that, of course, we can calculate what is a smart grid. But that is not exactly the same that if we, even if we find out that this is the most fantastic solution of this grid, that is not exactly the same thing as saying that this will happen. 
because it may happen that the greed owner find out that no, we make the greed in this way because then we earn more money. That have been uh, so. So uh, I, I will not go through this because it starts to be rather complicated. Take more on the other fundamental issues. So I lecture at the end of markets, and then I think I can come back to this issue because that is, let's say, one of the challenge. That's a very big challenge both in Europe and in, in US. Uh, may, not so much in US. I think they more have a structure like here where it's more regulated. Everything. I mean, S Sweden. Uh, just to say something, Sweden. I don't know what you know about Sweden, but. Some people know about Olof Palme, and it's very social democratic, but it's extremely liberalized. We have markets in everything currently, but high taxes at the same time. So a uh, nice combination. OK, so now I will stop the grid issues. On the other hand, we'll come back with the grid issues when I, I, we have a tutorial I will hear later when we have the tutorial, but that will be in the afternoon. But now I will start with the other part. As I said, there are two requirements in the when you have solar and wind power and whatever in any grid. One is to keep the voltage. You must keep the voltage. It should be 220 volt here everywhere, or plus minus 10 percent, whatever kind of sources you have. That is what we have worked with so far. Uh, what I will start with now is you have to keep the balance. And that is, when you push the button, you want the electricity. No matter if it's sunny or windy or whatever, you get an outage in the power plant, it has still to work. So you have to keep the balance in the system. So that is what I will start with now. I call this, in the earliest lecture, there was, should be another lecture in between here. So I, they, we have jumped over lecture five here. Anyhow, so now I call it lecture six and seven. Okay, day three, anyhow. It's the right date here. No, it's not the diary I did. It's the date of tomorrow. Uh, <coughs> because we have made some slight changes here. <coughs> so now I will talk about the balancing issues. How to keep the balance. This means that the wind power is going up and down like this. Just to make a very simple graph of that is that You have the demand. This is the time. You have the demand is going up and down like this. And then you have to supply this in some way. And I, I don't know what I and it's very much coal coal here in, in, uh, in uh, so you have the different power plants here. Just to make it very small, plant one plant two, and then you have plant three here, and then you have plant four here and plant four here, just to make it very simple. So this is, let's say, the traditional way in a thermal power system to operate, uh, operate a system. Uh, if you have more wind power, you can do it in two steps. Then you, it will look something like this. You stay, still have the same demand. And then you have the wind power first. Okay, wind power is going in something like this. And then what is happening is that then the the other power plants have to take the difference between the production and, and so on. And what you see here, here you have very little wind power and then you have a high demand. So then here you have to have a huge amount of other power plants, while here you have a very low demand, but at the same time a very high wind power. So then you get larger changes. So that is what you have. So this is, you can call it the fundamental. I will show you some figures for, for, for re reality here. But this is, let's say, you can call it the balancing issue. That is that you have to match the difference between the, you can call it the net. The net load is also very often called. It's the difference between uh, on and the production you can get. The issue is very much today. That it, that what I will talk now is not exactly this. I will talk about the following. We have the demand, and then we have the renewable energy. It works like this. 
because that's what you will get at 40 percent. I mean, this this is how it will look like when you have 40 percent solar power. Sometimes you will get much more d production than demand. As long as it's this, this I don't call high penetration. This I call low penetration. This is how it will look like when you have 40 percent of the yearly energy from solar and wind power. You will very often get much, much more production than you have demand. And sometimes you don't have anything and you still have to match the demand. This is the fundamental challenge when you come into so-called high penetration. And then the question is, how do you really keep the balance in the system when you don't have any regu- when you come into so-called inertia issues, you have to come into primary control. How do you handle that when you don't have any coal power at all any longer in these situations? So this is the least really the fundamental challenge, which is a lot of discussions around right now. So this is what I will talk a little about now. And I think that this is, voltage control is solvable. I mean, voltage control, what I showed you earlier, is <coughs> of course manageable. You can always have SVCs everywhere, and then you can manage the voltage. So it's, of course, you have, I mean, what I very much discussed earlier is that, which is the most economical solution? What can you do with different resources? But I have not said that there are any fundamental challenges. But of course here the question is, that is very much coming up nowadays. This is really fundamental issues now. How do you match a situation with really coming 100% of the power from solar and wind power? Let's say that whole India going to, let's say, 40% renewable. Then I'm absolutely sure that in some situation in India, you will have, perhaps not because you have solar power, which is very nice because it follows the demand more, but let's say you have come up to 50% from solar power, then you will have situations when you have as much solar power as you have demand in India. And then the question is how to handle this situation when the, when the solar power is distributed all over India. Then of course this I can say is a fundamental challenge that how do we manage the balance in the system? What happens when you push the button? It will not be more sunny just because you push the button. So you have to keep margins in some way. So. Uh, this is what I will start to talk about now. It's not exactly the right naming of the, of, of the lectures. I don't know if this is number three or number five. So what? It's the Tuesday lecture. Anyhow. OK, so I will start in the general issues, and that is the balancing challenges. First of all, when I say balancing challenges, I mean to have a reliable and nice balance. I didn't say that we have something to do in order, because physically, you always, as I said, told earlier, physically, you always have a balance in the system. Then it could be zero is equal to zero. I, ca I can write it like this. It's an extremely fundamental issue, and that is the following. Sum of production is equal to sum of load. and then including losses. This is not the requirement. This is physics. Whatever you do in a power system, it's, it's always valid. It's physically impossible not to fulfill that equation. So I cannot say that it's a challenge to do that. The challenge is to do it in a good way. And remember that there is one solution to this equation, one possible solution, and that is the following. Same equation. It's called blackout. But still, you fulfill the requirement. So remember that what you want to do is not to fulfill the balance. What you want to do is that not curtail here. That is the challenge. And of course, if you have solar and wind power, you don't want to curtail anything here either, because then you get less money because you don't have any income since you don't produce anything. So you want to maximize this from solar and wind power owners and from a demand point of view and the society, you don't want to curtail this one. But physically, you cannot, it's a bit, when I say that power system general balancing challenges, Ah, you will, I mean, the balancing, the balancing is not the problem because the balance will always be fulfilled by the, the physical laws. 
So the challenge is to maximize the demand and try to use as much as possible from the renewable sources and minimize, uh, mi mi minimize um, CO2 or uh, environmental problems and so on. So this I showed earlier. These are the fundamental issues, the aim of the power system, the balance. Um, as, uh, then I s uh, it's not correct. We are always discussing how to formulate this. Challenge to keep the balance. No, it's not a challenge because you physically always have the balance. Challenge is not to keep the balance. The challenge is to keep it with a high demand. So, of course, but of course you have to handle how to do this in a smart way. And then, of course, this is what I talked about earlier, uh, how to keep the voltage. So you have around uh, the right voltage, not 230. That is too high voltage for you. So you should have 220. Uh, the challenge is this. You should have a nice reliability. You should never be, you should never, I mean, the best way is, of course, 100% renewable, extremely cheap, and no, never curtail any consumers. And you don't have any power plants because that is destroying your disturbing, but that is of course impossible. So you have to do it in a reliable way. And then of course it must be an economic way, it has to be so cheap operation as possible, at, as a low cost, so you really use the low cost units first and it should be sustainable, of course. This is just to show some of what is going on. This, we start a bit to, to these are the way I see the most interesting systems in the world right now. There are some systems which are identify which are interesting. Why I say that these are interesting systems is because they are isolated. If you see India, for example, it's the same with China. I mean, India can never solve their problems with trading with neighbors because it's, it's I mean, India is too big for that. So the India, uh, then of course, if you take a certain state, can solve their balancing issues by trading with their neighbors. So I mean, perhaps, by, by what is interesting is that these two areas is more or less isolated. You have another area which I will try in the future to in integrate, and that is Texas in the United States. Texas is more or less an isolated system. They have a peak of 70 gigawatt of demand, something like this, and then they have small, AC, uh, small DC transmission to their neighboring states. But they are keeping the frequency and the very s marginal trading with their neighbors. Denmark is not so interesting as I see it because Denmark have a huge amount of trading capability. Whatever is happening in Denmark, it, it's balanced in Norway or Sweden. So Denmark, when you see Denmark has 50% of wind power, that is not so interesting because uh, that's, they don't have any balancing challenges of the same type. But these two countries, these two areas have challenges. And Ireland is currently, they have one DC line to, to, to Scotland and another DC line here to, to, to uh, Wales. So they have sometimes in this island 75% of, of uh, wind power. So, uh, so, and then of course they have to, and then of course the wind power is changing like this and the, the challenges is normally in the night between Saturday and Sunday because then the demand is very low and it can be very windy. So they have some challenges. So a lot of the interesting things it's really happening in, in, in Ireland. Then you have Portugal and Spain are very interesting also because they have, as you see here, they have uh, Spain and nearly 20 gigawatt of wind and Portugal have 4 gigawatts, so it's 24 gigawatt of wind and in addition to that they have solar. But the trading capacity is uh, uh, Portugal and Spain, that's not so interesting, Spain and France have 2 gigawatt, something of the size. So this means that nearly everything that is happening on that Iberian Peninsula has to be balanced in that peninsula which is, of course, very interesting. And then the question is, how do they handle that? Portugal have had 104% of their demand from wind power. So they had more wind power than demand in Portugal. And then they could export it in, in to, to, to Spain, and Spain didn't have any problem. Portugal have hydropower, and they have had some pump storage. I know that when they had high penetration here in Portugal, they have a pump storage plant. And then at the same time, they are releasing water in that and pumping in another one at the same time because then they have very much reserves. The hydro very fast by pumping in one, releasing in the other one. That means, of course, from efficiency point of view, uh, terrible. You lose a lot of percent. In, but on the other hand, okay, how often do these extreme cases happen? Not many hours a year. And it's a very practical way of handling it. But this means, of course, that 
then they get a lot of reserves, even if they have 100%. So they can have 100% of the load, but that doesn't mean that the other power plants are not active. And this means, of course, at the same time, since they are, acti they are using the, hydro, the pumped hydro, that means that they get the synchronous machines running at the same time, and then they also get both the inertia and also the voltage control at the same time. But on the can, it's not a very efficient way of doing it, but of course it works. So you have a lot of these, what is interesting with what exactly I said now, it's extremely difficult to get these kind of things fr from, uh, from different companies, but how do you really handle this? The problem, the problem is very often with, with uh, distribution type of companies is that they say you get information when they don't handle problems. For example, you had a blackout in uh, southwest Australia and, and then you get, uh, oh, we had a problem, it was caused by this. And, but when things work, it's extremely difficult. Oh, they don't even measure. Yeah, of course we do like this, no problem. So, I mean, it's very often, you, you, it's very hard to get information of very interesting cases when you didn't get the problem because you don't even write a report. I had a report, big report about we didn't have a problem. No, we never see. <laughs> okay, but Spain has, uh, this is, uh, sorry, this is a bit old. This was from 19, uh, this is two years old, I think. Now they had, last year, it was 104%. Ireland had 52%, and I met a person two weeks ago, and then he said 60% or something like this, 70%, I think. Uh, Spain has, I don't have any updated figures, but the maximum share can be very high. Uh, from energy point of view, oh, this is old. This should be 21. I think I had better in the other slide. This should be 20%, 24%, I think, here. It depends. The wind is varying between different years, but they have around 20% of their yearly energy. So from my point of view, when people say that, okay, what is an integration issue? Then I say that, I mean, 20% can work. I can say it directly. I mean, you already, it already works in, and which is a very country. No, no, they don't have. But at here, if you have a bigger country, I'm invited to South Korea in, in December, and they have ambitions of really increase renewable, and then they are very much discussing exactly these challenges. But I think that, I mean, 20%, is, I can directly say that 20% of the yearly energy coming from variable renewable, hard to say that. Of course, you have to handle it, but to say that, no, 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 it doesn't work. Because if you read older papers that are 10 years old, people say that, no, no, you can never have more than 5%. That doesn't work. But I, I, I am hard to say that 20% that should be an issue. 30 or 40, I, that comes up. <coughs> this is the same as earlier. <coughs> uh, there is one discussion, and I think that I'm sure that this is certainly discussed in India also, the question is now, <coughs> should we have more grids? The benefit, there is a very big difference here, be with, uh, uh, there is a difference between wind and solar here. Let's say we have Europe. Here the sun is coming, and then of course the go goes up here in the morning, and then you have the, and then the sun, Sunrise goes over Europe like this. And then the issue is that you always have, okay, it could be cloudy here and not so cloudy here. So, but in some way, in the day, it is sunny. And in the summer, it is sunny. So you will get some power here. Uh, the interesting thing is that the, that the sun is, of course, going all over Europe like this. Wind is different. Sometimes it's very windy here calm here, can be windy here, calm here, windy here, windy here, and that moves around. This means that wind power, for wind power integration, transmission is very interesting. Because then you, sometimes it's windy here, then you can export. Sometimes it's windy here, you can export. So, to solution very much to wind is very much transmission. So, it helps very much wind power integration to have more transmission. And that is very much discussed currently in Europe. And it's also another issue, and that is that we have hydropower here in the Alps, in Switzerland and so on, and then we have hydropower in here, and we have hydropower here, hydropower in the Scandinavian countries. And that means that, of course, when it's not so windy here, we can import, and when it's very windy, we can decrease the production in the hydro and export. So trading with wind power is very smart. 
Solar power, on the other hand, if you have a huge amount of solar power, what is the benefit of solar power is that it's very regular. Solar power goes like this. It should be zero down here, of course. So, uh, always product, uh, you, you have a very regular, regular way. And this means that batteries are more interesting in solar systems because then I said earlier that it was, most, but that was for if you have huge amount, not, not for solving local voltage problem. But if you see, because here, of course, that if you get a very high surplus here in the day, then you can store it and then you use it in the night. There is, I don't know if you heard about this solar thermal, uh, solar thermal, where you can have um, solar thermal works like this, which is starts to be, does it exist in India? Do you have solar thermal somewhere? Uh huh. Okay. Because what is interesting with solar thermal, this is uh, rather big research that is going on right now, and that is that you have a generator here, and then you have mirrors like this. You have the sun here somewhere, and then you have mirrors, so you are in reality heating up here, and then you are in reality having a thermal generator that is running, making this one run. What you can have then is that you can heat up an oil, heat an oil, and that can be, and then of course, uh, that, that, and then you have here, you have salt storage. I don't know if you heard about this. What you do is that you can heat up you have a salt that is melting. You, you know, for, for example, water. When water goes from, from uh, to, to ice, you need a huge amount of energy to make it from liquid to something solid. And it's the same with a salt, that you need a huge amount of energy to make it from a liquid salt to, 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 um, to something fixed. And then what you can do is that you can melt, use this heat to melt the salt, and the salt becomes around 300 degrees. And then in the night, you can have this uh, melted salt in order to heat up water to 100 degrees, and then you can use the steam in order to run this turbine. So with, when you have solar thermal, you can get a daily, daily uh, flattering of the, of, the, of the system. And that means that you can, in reality, yes, you have for solar PV, you don't have the automatic storage. You have to have batteries or something because it's pure electricity. But uh, when you have this kind of thing, you have uh, storage here, and then you could use this kind of salt storage. This has been this, I think there are German, uh, and, and then the, que of course the question is, because this salt is rather cheap, but on the other hand, the problem is that um, the question is the efficiency and this kind of thing. But technically, this is of course possible, and this means that if you have this kind of technology, you, you, you can do it every night. That has been discussed to have in Northern Africa to have these kind of systems, and then, they, and then you can get a rather flat production from the solar power which is, of course, very interesting when you come up to this high penetration. But, I mean, this storage is more interesting for solar power. For wind power, that's why I talked about this here. So, grids are very smart for, mainly smart for, for, um, uh, for wind power, because wind power is a bit, it's regional, I mean, it's not that it's windy here and not windy here, that is, doesn't exist. But it can be windy here, and not windy here, and I assume it's the same in, in, in India, that it can be very wind in the southern part, but not But of course, the, the sun, you have a much higher correlation, but you have the regular changes over the day. So storage is interesting for solar power. In general, this is some kind of storage, while uh, transmission is, let's say, you can call it the main solution for wind power, as, as, uh, let's say, not a solution, but it's an important issue. So that is discussing, and then of course there's a competition that you can do it in di different ways. So there are a lot of discussions to have much more grids in Europe, and, and one of the driving forces is the, may, is the wind power. It's not the solar power, it's the wind power is driving the force for, for more grids. <coughs> so, uh, Just about renewable, now I will say something in general about renewable energy. This is what I will talk about here, is that 
uh, renewable energy is of course produced by the resources. This is, you can call it very different compared to, to uh, fossil fuels and nuclear. Because what you do normally is, is uh, with fossil fuels, you have the source, which is, can be coal, you have a coal mine somewhere, and then you just take the coal, and then you transport it, and then you produce the electricity where you need the electricity. So if you have a state or a town or whatever, and you need power in the state, you don't put the, you don't put the coal power plant close to the coal mine, because coal is so concentrated, and the same with nuclear fuel, it's so concentrated, so you transport the fuel, and that is very important. Oil, gas, coal, nuclear, you transport the fuel. For hydro, solar, wind, there is no fuel. You transport the electricity. That is why Siemens and ABB loves renewable, because then you need transmission. While other companies, the transport companies, they love the fuels, because then they need the transport. So, for example, in Sweden, we have coal, uh, we have currently not so long time anymore, but we have combined heat and power in the center of Stockholm that sometimes uses coal. Not a problem, you just transport it with both. It's extremely cheap. Just one thing, and uh, uh, just, uh, I, I saw one, if you have a gas pipe like this, I think one and a half meter in diameter, or something like this, in this gas pipe, you can transport 500 terawatt per year. In the transmission, in the 400 kV line, you transport 10 terawatt hours. I mean, just look on the space that the 400 kV line is taking. It's huge. So, I mean, transport fuels is extremely efficient, and that is why you do, in most countries where you have, for example, where you, most countries where you have uh, fossil fuels, as I assume, you don't, you don't have a tradition of a lot of, lot of transmi transmission. I think that India is based on fossil fuels, or and because of that, you just have the coal plant everywhere. You don't need so much transmission. You need a little extra transmission because of reliability. If I have an outage in my power plant, I can import instead. But from the energy supply point of view, you, it's better to have the local supply. But when you come into more renewables, you get a different situation. So that is one of the challenges. With more renewable, you will need more transmission, because that is the way you are transporting the energy. You don't do that in the, in the other alternative. So the energy has to be, so first you have the energy is produced by the resources, of course, which is not the same thing as for coal, because there you transport the fuel. And then the energy has to be transported to the consumption center, and that is in with the renewable uh, power. Then, of course, this means that you have to have lines. And then it varies. Solar power, it varies, like this. Wind power, sometimes it's windy. Hydropower, sometimes some year is it rain, sometimes it's not. So this is valid for, and this is the fundamental issue. So you need, and because of this, you have to handle it in some way. I can take one example here. This is Sweden. In this blue area, we have the hydropower in the Nordic system. And we have had it since uh, decades. <coughs> what you see in Sweden is a huge amount of transmission lines. Why? Exactly because this is what you see in countries with a huge amount of renewables. You have it in Brazil, where you have this Itaipu, where you are transporting the power from the uh, hydropower. You have it in China, where you have also transport of electricity. They also have a lot of wind power up in the, in the north, and they are transporting this. So, and uh, in Sweden, we have had this in decades, because up to uh, 1970 or something, we had only hydropower in Sweden. Uh, so, and then in Sweden, it looks like this. Here we have 10 million people in Sweden, here we have 9 million, and up there we have 1 million, and all the hydro is in the north. So of course we need transmission. And this is the background of, you have ASEA, which then joined into uh, Brown Bovier, and they created ABB, and that's why they are so good. We had the first 400 kV line in Sweden, because we needed it, and it's because of renewable energy, because renewable energy is transport. 
So that is, let's say, the background of, of uh, let's say, the so everywhere where you see long transmission lines in the world, it's normally, bec it's, uh, normally because of um, renewable energy. You have it in western United States, they import hydro from Canada. You have it in eastern United States, where you have Quebec, where they have a lot of hydro also. So you have all the transmission. The issue is, on the other hand, that the inflow is changing a lot. And the difference between 86 terawatt hours, we have 45 gigawatt of hydro in the Nordic system. The inflow can vary 86 terawatt hours between a so-called wet year and the dry year. And this means that, of course, that, and this, of course, it has always been like this, and it will always be like this. And this means that in a wet year, to have a, to have a country with only hydropower, okay, what do you do if it's not raining? And what do you do with the surplus when it's very rainy? That's a challenge. So it's very good for a thermal system, a, a hydro system as a Norwegian, they are wholly hydro, to be connected to other systems. Because then in a wet year they can export, and in a dry year they can import. And that is the tradition that we have had in, in, in the Nordic system, and that is that we are trading with our neighbors a lot. So we have a huge amount of trading continuously like this, because of the renewable energy. That is varying. The difference is that when you get the change, when you when you have hydro, you change between different years. In a wet year, you export. In a dry year, you can import. And so on. With solar and wind power, you get changes over the day. But then, of course, it's the same thing. That if it's very windy here, then you can export. If you're not, not so windy, then we import. So because of this, it's very smart to have more, more trading and so on. This is, uh, not, this is not the latest link we have. One link here, we have one link here to, uh, Lithu uh, to Lithuania here. Where this is a bit of an older picture. <coughs> so Sweden, we have a rather advanced electricity market, but that is not so much, yes, we have liberalization and so on, but we have traded a very lot because of the renewable energy. I mean, in, in India, I assume that if you have coal power, I mean, in, in your state, then of course you have your coal power. Why should you trade with your neighbor that also have coal power? Why should I import from them? It just creates losses. It's better that I make my own. But then, of course, if I have an outage in my power plant, then, of course, I can import, so I don't have to have a reserve plant. But that is the difference when you get this kind of renewable energy. You want to do more. Uh, these are the things that I will <coughs> uh, talk uh, rather much about, and that is the challenges when you get large amounts of solar and wind power. I can draw this figure again. Another scale. We have demand here. And then we have, let's say just put it in here somewhere. solar plus wind. And then we do it again. Net demand, that is the difference between these ones. And here it's rather big. Here it's big. Here it suddenly go down to zero. Here it is negative. And then it starts to be very big again. Here it's zero again. Negative. Zero again. And then it increases. And then, of course, this is what the other controllable things in the system have to manage in some way. Here you need some kind of storage, or you need to curtail the solar and the wind. Here you get ramps. So the challenge, the three challenges here are keep the continuous balance. And instead of having this one, which is smooth, then you will get faster ramps and lower amplitudes. Here you see that you go from this level. Here you will see that the control. So you need faster control. Now I have a rather extreme case here, but, but I, I will come back to that. 
and I will show you more realistic figures than this as just I draw by hand. So you have to keep the continuous balance, you have to follow the net demand, the difference between the demand and, and the, the, the solar and the wind. And then the question is how to handle situations when there's no wind, how to handle this situation. Even if you have solar and wind power, you have the night and there's no wind and you have to cover the demand. How do you do that? So in some way you have to handle that and that is very much discussed, how to handle that if you have solar and wind power. And the other situation which is not so much discussed but it starts to be more discussed. What do you do when it's very windy and sunny and no demand? Which is of course a challenge and then you have these situations. You can in this case a surplus. This is of course physically, you remember production is equal to demand. So this is physically impossible. So then you, it should be something like this. Is this possible? This means that you, the whole demand in a country is covered by only solar and wind. Okay, how do you keep the margins in the system if you suddenly get an outage in the line? Where do you keep the margins? How do you handle this situation? How do you keep the frequency in the system where you have power plants that don't have synchronous machines? How do you keep the voltage in the system? Very much discussed. I mean, so in the beginning the question was, Leonard, you are working with wind power. But what do you do when it's not windy? Now the question is, okay, Leonard, you are working with wind power. What do you do when it's extremely windy? <laughs> and then the question is, what do you do when it's changing between the areas, when these two extremes? That is, of course, the challenge. So the question is, what do you do when it's not windy? What do you do when it's windy? And how do you do when it's changing between the areas? So these are, and then there are specific challenges in all these kind of, of areas here. So there are specific challenges here, specific challenges here, specific challenges here. So I, I normally try to divide it into these groups in order to identify uh, what are the challenges. So now I have two minutes more in that wrong time, but then I will do it. <coughs> so I start with this handling of the continuous balance, that is to handle this, that you have to continue, continuously f handle that in, a, in an efficient way, because since the demand, the net demand is something like this, this means that there must be power plants or that, that is following exactly the demand from second to second. So there must be a ramping capacity which is high enough. And what is happening is that the ramping needs is increasing when you go from only load and you have the net load. That is, for example, I, saw, I showed you this earlier in Germany. What happened was that when you get the solar eclipse, the change, the ramp was rather high. It was 14 gigawatt per hour or something. And then, of course, you have to have other power plants that can follow this. And it's not following like this. You, you're not following from one second to the next second. You have to following continuously during an hour. This is very much discussed in systems like, let's say, uh, like India, where you have thermal power. And it's, for example, I, I know that Ireland, they have a lot of coal power also. They have also e even worse, not even worse, but they have peat which is another resource, which is uh, peat is something that is happening geologically before you get the coal. Uh, it's old biomass that is uh, first become peat and then it becomes coal if you just press it enough. <coughs> you, you, uh, you have the, you, you, uh, you burn solid fuel and then the question is, it's not always so easy to, to ramp them fast. On the other hand, if you have more interconnections to your neighbors, you can uh, collaborate because probably the wind power perhaps go down in one way, in one state it goes down and in another state it goes up. And then of course the total change is less and then you have more power plants. So here you see directly the benefit of coordinating. The problem is also that you have, this is what I showed. This is how, what the result was. Did you know that this will happen? No. You didn't know about here the wind and solar went up, but you didn't know that it would be something like this. You thought it may be something like this. In, or you don't, um, solar is rather easy, but then it depends on the cloud. I mean, the source up on the other side of the clouds, of course, you know. Uh, but uh, what is really happening down here? 
to the ground you don't know. Wind is rather uncertain. And this means that, yes, can I follow this? Yes, I can do that. I can plan to follow this. But did I know that this will happen? No. So then you have to keep margins and then you can to, to keep for this uncertainty, you can call it. And that means that what I said here, larger interconnected areas reduce the overall variation, but requires enough grids, of course. So, so that is, let's say, the benefit of having grids. So instead of having fast plants, so, and that is, of course, an, when you are discussing what should we do. And then the question is, should we have faster regulation or should we have more interconnections? Because if you have more interconnections, you can cooperate better. Maybe that creates losses, but I, I, that, I think that is a minor issue here. Okay, I will continue with this, but uh, I think now we, I should stop here. One o'clock with uh, that strange watch, which is 10 minutes ahead. Okay, thank you. I will continue. <laughs>